Chapter Two of the Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fairy Ship. I was introduced that evening at dinner to Mr. Harland's physician and also to his private secretary. I was not greatly prepossessed in favor of either of these gentlemen. Dr. Braille was a dark, slim, clean-shaven man of middle age, with expressionless brown eyes and sleek black hair, which was carefully brushed and parted down the middle. He was quiet and self-contained in manner, and yet I thought I could see that he was fully alive to the advantages of his position as traveling medical adviser to an American millionaire. I have not mentioned till now that Morton Harland was an American. I was always rather in the habit of forgetting the fact, as he had long ago forsworn his nationality and had naturalized himself as a British subject. But he had made his vast fortune in America and was still the controlling magnet of many large financial interests in the States. He was, however, much more English than American, for he had been educated at Oxford, and as a young man had been always associated with English society and English ways. He had married an English wife, who died when their first child, his daughter, was born, and he was wont to set down all Miss Catherine's mopish languors to a delicacy inherited from her mother and to a lack of a mother's care in childhood. In my opinion, Catherine was robust enough, but it was evident that from a very early age she had been given her own way to the fullest extent, and had been so accustomed to have every little ailment exaggerated and made the most of, that she had grown to believe health of body and mind as well-nigh impossible to the human being. Dr. Braille, I soon perceived, lent himself to this attitude, and I did not like the covert gleam of his mahogany-colored eyes as he glanced rapidly from father to daughter in the pauses of conversation, watching them as narrowly as a cat might watch a couple of unwary mice. The secretary, Mr. Swinton, was a pale, precise-looking young man with a somewhat servile demeanor, under which he concealed an inordinately good opinion of himself, his ideas were centered in and bounded by the art of stenography. He was an adept in shorthand and typewriting, could jot down, I forget how many crowds of jostling words a minute, and never made a mistake. He was a clockwork model of punctuality and dispatch, of respectfulness and obedience. But he was no more than a machine. He could not be moved to a spontaneous utterance or a spontaneous smile unless both smile and utterance were the result of some pleasantness affecting himself. Neither Dr. Braille nor Mr. Swinton were men whom one could positively like or dislike. They simply had the power of creating an atmosphere in which my spirit found itself swimming like a goldfish in a bowl, wondering how it got in and how it could get out. As I sat rather silently at table, I felt, rather than saw, Dr. Braille regarding me with a kind of perplexed curiosity. I was as fully aware of his sensations as of my own. I knew that my presence irritated him, though he was not clever enough to explain even to himself the cause of his irritation. So far as Mr. Swinton was concerned, he was comfortably wrapped up in a pachydermatous hide of self-appreciation so that he thought nothing about me one way or the other, except as a guest of his patrons, and one, therefore, to whom he was bound to be civil. But with Dr. Braille it was otherwise. I was a puzzle to him, and, after a brief study of me, an annoyance. He forced himself into conversation with me, however, and we interchanged a few remarks on the weather, and on the various beauties of the coast along which we had been sailing all day. "'I see that you care very much for fine scenery,' he said. "'Few women do.' "'Really?' and I smiled. "'Is admiration of the beautiful a special privilege of men only?' "'It should be,' he answered with a little bow, 
we are the admirers of your sex i made no answer mr harland looked at me with a somewhat quizzical air you are not a believer in compliments he said was it a compliment i asked laughingly i'm afraid i'm very dense i did not see that it was meant as one dr brayle's dark brows drew together in a slight frown with that expression on his face he looked very much like an italian poisoner of old time the kind of man whom caesar borgia might have employed to give the happy dispatch to his enemies by some sure and undiscoverable means known only to intricate chemistry presently mr harland spoke again while he peeled a pear slowly and delicately with a deft movement of his fruit knife that suggested cruelty and the flaying alive of some sentient thing our little friend is of a rather strange disposition he observed she has the indifference of an old-world philosopher to the sayings of speeches that are merely socially agreeable she is ardent in soul but suspicious in mind she imagines that a pleasant word may often be used to cover a treacherous action and if a man is as rude and blunt as myself for example she prefers that he should be rude and blunt rather than that he should attempt to conceal his roughness by an amiability which it is not his nature to feel here he looked up at me from the careful scrutiny of his nearly flayed pear isn't that so certainly i answered but that's not a strange or original attitude of mind the corners of his ugly mouth curled satirically pardon me dear lady it is the normal and strictly reasonable attitude of the healthy human pygmy is that it should accept as gospel all that it is told of a nature soothing and agreeable to itself it should believe among other things that it is a very precious pygmy among natural forces destined to be immortal and to share with divine intelligence the privileges of heaven put out by the merest trifle troubled by a spasm driven almost to howling by a toothache and generally helpless in all very aggravated adverse circumstances it should still console itself with the idea that its being its proportions and perfections are superb enough to draw down deity into a human shape as a creature of human necessities in order that it the pygmy should claim kinship with the divine now and for ever what gorgeous blasphemy in such a scheme what magnificent arrogance i was silent but i could almost hear my heart beating with suppressed emotion i knew morton harland was an atheist so far as atheism is possible to any creature born of spirit as well as matter but i did not think he would air his opinion so openly and at once before me the first evening of my stay on board his yacht i saw however that he spoke in this way hoping to move me to an answering argument for the amusement of himself and the other two men present and therefore i did what was incumbent upon me to do in such a situation held my peace dr brayle watched me curiously and poor catherine harland turned her plaintive eyes upon me full of alarm she had learned to dread her father's fondness for starting topics which led to religious discussions of a somewhat heated nature but as i did not speak mr harland was placed in the embarrassing position of a person propounding a theory which no one shows any eagerness to accept or to deny and looking slightly confused he went on in a lighter and more casual way i had a friend once at oxford a wonderful fellow full of strange dreams and occult fancies he was one of those who believed in the divine half of man he used to study curious old books and manuscripts till long past midnight and never seemed tired his father had lived by choice in some desert corner of egypt for forty years and in egypt this boy had been born of his mother he never spoke his father died suddenly and left him a large fortune under trustees till he came of age with instructions 
that he was to be taken to england and educated at oxford and that when he came into possession of his money he was to be left free to do as he liked with it i met him when he was almost halfway through his university course i was only two or three years his senior but he always looked much younger than i and he was as we all said uncanny as uncanny as our little friend here indicating me by a nod of his head and a smile which was meant to be kindly he never practiced or trained for anything and yet all things came easily to him he was as magnificent in his sports as he was in his studies and i remember how well i remember it that there came a time at last when we all grew afraid of him if we saw him coming along the high we avoided him he had something of terror as well as admiration for us and though i was of his college and constantly thrown into association with him i soon became infected with the general scare one night he stopped me in the quadrangle where he had his rooms here mr harland broke off suddenly i'm boring you he said i really have no business to inflict the recollections of my youth upon you dr brayle's brown eyes showed a glistening animal interest pray go on he urged it sounds like the chapter of a romance i'm not a believer in romance said mr harland grimly facts are enough in themselves without any embroidered additions this fellow was a fact a healthy strong energetic living fact he stopped me in the quadrangle as i tell you and he laid his hand on my shoulder i shrank from his touch and had a restless desire to get away from him what's the matter with you harland he said in a grave musical voice that was peculiarly his own you seem afraid of me if you are the fault is in yourself not in me i shuffled my feet about on the stone pavement not knowing what to say then i stammered out the foolish excuses young men make when they find themselves in an awkward corner he listened to my stammering remarks about the other fellows with attentive patience then he took his hand from my shoulder with a quick decisive movement look here harland he said you are taking up all the conventions and traditions with which our poor old alma mater is encrusted and sticking them over you like burrs they'll cling remember it's a pity you choose this way of going i'm starting at the farther end where oxford leaves off and life begins i suppose i stared for he went on i mean life that goes forward not life that goes backward picking up the stale crumbs fallen from centuries that have finished their banquet and passed on there i won't detain you we shall not meet often but don't forget what i have said that if you are afraid of me or of any other man or of any existing thing the fault is in yourself not in the persons or objects you fear i don't see it i blurted out angrily what of the other fellows they think you're queer he laughed bless the other fellows he said they're with you in the same boat they think me queer because they are queer that is out of line themselves i was irritated by his easy indifference and asked him what he meant by out of line suppose you see a beautiful garden harmoniously planned he said still smiling and some clumsy fellow comes along and puts a crooked pigsty up among the flower beds you would call that out of line wouldn't you unsuitable to say the least of it oh i said hotly so you consider me and my friends crooked pigsties in your landscape he made me a gay half apologetic gesture something of the type dear boy he said but don't worry the crooked pigsty is always the most popular kind of building in the world you will live in with that he bade me good night and went i was very angry with him for i was a conceited youth and thought myself and my particular associates the very cream of oxford but he took all the highest honors that year and when he finally left the university he vanished so to speak in a blaze of intellectual glory i have never seen him again and never heard of him 
and so I suppose his studies led him nowhere. He must be an elderly man now. He may be lame, blind, lunatic, or what is more probable still, he may be dead, and I don't know why I think of him, except that his theories were much the same as those of our little friend. Again indicating me by a nod. He never cared for agreeable speeches, always rather mistrusted social conventions, and believed in a higher life after death. Or a lower, I put in quietly. Ah, yes, there must be a downgrade, of course, if there is an up. The two would be part of each other's existence. But as I accept neither, the point does not matter. I looked at him, and I suppose my looks expressed wonder, or pity, or both, for he averted his glance from mine. You are something of a spiritualist, I believe, said Dr. Braille, lifting his hard eyes from the scrutiny of the tablecloth and fixing them upon me. Not at all, I answered at once and with emphasis. That is, if you mean by the term spiritualist, a credulous person who believes in mediumistic trickery, automatic writing, and the like, that is sheer nonsense and self-deception. Several experienced scientists give these matters considerable attention, suggested Mr. Swinton primly. I smiled. Science, like everything else, has its borderland, I said, from which the brain can easily slip off into chaos. The most approved scientific professors are liable to this dire end of their speculations. They forget that in order to understand the infinite, they must first be sure of the infinite in themselves. You speak like an oracle, fair lady, said Mr. Harland, but despite your sage utterances, man remains as finite as ever. If he chooses the finite state, certainly he does, I answered. He is always what he elects to be. Mr. Harland seemed desirous of continuing the argument, but I would say no more. The topic was too serious and sacred with me to allow it to be lightly discussed by persons whose attitude of mind was distinctly opposed and antipathetic to all things beyond the merely mundane. After dinner, Miss Catherine professed herself to be suffering from neuralgia, and gathering up her shawls and wraps, asked me to excuse her for going to bed early. I bade her good night, and leaving my host, and the two other men to their smoke, I went up on deck. We were anchored off Mull, and against a starlit sky of exceptional clearness, the dark mountains of Morven were outlined with a softness as of black velvet. The yacht rested on perfectly calm waters, shining like polished steel, and the warm stillness of the summer night was deliciously soothing and restful. Our captain and one or two of the sailors were about on duty, and I sat in the stern of the vessel, looking up into the glorious heavens. The tapering bowsprit of the Diana pointed aloft, as it were, into a woven web of stars, and I lost myself in imaginary flight among those glittering, unknown worlds, oblivious of my material surroundings and forgetting that despite the splendid evidences of a governing intelligence in the beauty and order of the universe spread about them every day, my companions in the journey of pleasure we were undertaking together were actually destitute of all faith in God, and had less perception of the existing divine than the humblest plant may possess that instinctively forces its way upward to the light. I did not think of this, it was no use thinking about it, as I could not better the position, but I found myself curiously considering the story Mr. Harland had told about his college friend at Oxford. I tried to picture his face and figure, till presently it seemed as if I saw him. Indeed, I could have sworn that a man's shadowy form stood immediately in front of me, bending upon me a searching glance from eyes that were strangely familiar. Startled at this wraith of my own fancy, I half rose from my chair, then sank back again with a laugh at my imagination's too vivid power of portrayal. A figure did certainly present itself, but one of sufficient bulk to convince me of its substantiality. 
this was the captain of the diana a cheery-looking personage of a thoroughly nautical type who approaching me lifted his cap and said that's a wonderfully fine yacht that has just dropped anchor behind us she's illuminated too have you seen her no i answered and turned in the direction he indicated an involuntary exclamation escaped me there about half a mile to our rear floated a schooner of exquisite proportions and fairy-like grace outlined from stem to stern by delicate borderings of electric light as though decorated for some great festival and making quite a glittering spectacle in the darkness of the deepening night we could see active figures at work on deck the sails were dropped and quickly furled but the quivering radiance remained running up every tapering mast and spar so that the whole vessel seemed drawn on the dusky air with pencil points of fire i stood up gazing at the wonderful sight in silent amazement and admiration with the captain beside me and it was he who first spoke i can't make her out he said perplexedly we never heard a sound except just when she dropped anchor and that was almost noiseless how she came round the point yonder so suddenly is a mystery i was keeping a sharp lookout too surely she's very large for a sailing vessel i queried the largest i've ever seen he replied but how did she sail that's what i want to know he looked so puzzled that i laughed well i suppose in the usual way i said with sails ay that's all very well and he glanced at me with a compassionate air as at one who knew nothing about seafaring but sails must have wind and there hasn't been a capful all the afternoon or evening yet she came in with crowded canvas full out as if there was a regular southwester and found her anchorage as easy as you please all in a minute too if there was a wind it wasn't a wind belonging to this world wouldn't mr harland perhaps like to see her i took the hint and ran down into the saloon which by this time was full of the stifling odors of smoke and whiskey mr harland was there drinking and talking somewhat excitedly with dr brayle while his secretary listened and looked on i explained why i had ventured to interrupt their conversation and they accompanied me up on deck the strange yacht looked more bewilderingly brilliant than ever the heavens having somewhat clouded over and as we all the captain included leaned over our own deck rail and gazed at her shining outlines we heard the sound of delicious music and singing floating across the quiet sea some millionaire's toy said mr harland she's superbly built sailing vessels are always more elegant than steam though not half so useful i expect she'll lie becalmed here for a day or two it's a wonder she's got round here at all said the captain there wasn't any wind to bring her mr harland looked amused there must have been some wind derrick he answered only it wasn't boisterous enough for a hardy salt like you to feel it there wasn't a breath declared derrick firmly not enough to blow a baby's curl then how did she get here asked dr brayle captain derrick's lifted eyebrows expressed his inability to solve the enigma i said just now if there was a wind it wasn't a wind belonging to this world mr harland turned upon him quickly well there are no winds belonging to other worlds that will ever disturb our atmosphere he said come come derrick you don't think that yacht is a ghost do you a sort of flying dutchman spectre captain derrick smiled broadly no sir i don't there's flesh and blood aboard i've seen the men hauling down canvas and i know that but the way she sailed in bothers me all that electric light is rather ostentatious said dr brayle i suppose the owner wants to advertise his riches that doesn't follow said mr harland with some sharpness i grant you we live in an advertising age but i don't fancy the owner of that vessel is a pill or a plaster or even a special tea he may want to amuse himself it may be the birthday of his wife or one of his children 
there may be several inoffensive reasons for his lighting up, and he may think no more of advertisement than you or I. That's true, assented Dr. Braille, with a quick concession to his patron's humor. But people nowadays do so many queer things for mere notoriety's sake that it is barely possible to avoid suspecting them. They will even kill themselves in order to be talked about. Fortunately, they don't hear what's said of them, returned Mr. Harland, or they might alter their minds and remain alive. It's hardly worth while to hang yourself in order to be called a fool. While this talk went on, I remained silent, watching the illuminated schooner with absorbed fascination. Suddenly, while I still gazed upon her, every spark with which she was, as it were, bejeweled, went out and only the ordinary lamps, common to the watches of the night, on board a vessel at Anchorage, burned dimly here and there, like red winking eyes. For the rest, she was barely visible, save by an indistinct tracery of blurred black lines. The swiftness with which her brilliancy had been eclipsed startled us all, and drew from Captain Derrick that remark that it was rather queer, what pantomimists call a quick change said mr harland with a laugh the show is over for to-night let us turn in to-morrow morning we'll try and make acquaintance with the stranger and find out for captain derrick's comfort how she managed to sail without wind we bade each other good-night then and descended to our several quarters when i found myself alone in the luxurious stateroom suite allotted to me the first thing i did was to open one of the portholes and listen to the music which still came floating from the mysterious yacht. It was a music full of haunting sweetness and rhythmic melody, and I was not sure whether it was evolved from stringed instruments or singing voices. By climbing up on the sofa in my sitting room, I could look out through the porthole on the near sea, rippling close to me and bringing, as I fancied, with every ripple, a new cadence, a tenderer snatch of tune. A subtle scent was on the salt air, as of roses mingled with the freshness of the scarcely moving waters. It came, I thought, from the beautiful blossoms which so lavishly adorned my rooms. I could not see the yacht from my point of observation, but I could hear the music she had on board, and that was enough for immediate delight. Leaving the porthole open, I lay down on the sofa immediately beneath it and composed myself to listen. The soft breath of the sea blew on my cheeks, and with every breath the delicate vibrations of appealing harmony rose and fell. It was as if these enchanting sounds were being played or sung for me alone. In a delicious languor I drowsed, as it were, with my eyes open losing myself in a labyrinth of happy dreams and fancies which came to me unbidden, till presently the music died softly away like a retreating wave and ceased altogether. I waited a few minutes, listening breathlessly, lest it should begin again and I lose some note of it. Then, hearing no more, I softly closed the porthole and drew the curtain. I did this with an odd reluctance, feeling somehow that I had shut out a friend, and I half apologized to this vague sentiment by reminding myself of the lateness of the hour. It was nearly midnight. I had intended writing to Francesca, but I was now disinclined for anything but rest. The music which had so entranced me throbbed still in my ears, and made my heart beat with a quick sense of joy and a warm atmosphere of peace and comfort came over me, when at last I lay down in my luxurious bed and slipped away into the land of sleep. Ah, what a land it is, that magic land of sleep, a land shadowing with wings, where, amid many shifting and shimmering wonders of darkness and light, the palace of vision stands uplifted, stately and beautiful, with golden doors set open to the wanderer, I made my entrance there that night, often and often as I had been within its enchanted precincts before, there were a million halls of marvel as yet unvisited, and among these I found myself, under a dome 
which seemed of purest crystal lit with fire, listening to one invisible who, speaking as from a great height, discoursed to me of love. End of chapter 2「The Angel of a Dream The voice that spoke to me was silvery clear, and fell, as it were, through the air, dividing space with sweetness. It was soft and resonant, and the thrill of tenderness within it was as though an angel sang through tears. Never had I heard anything so divinely pure and compassionate, and all my being strove to lift itself towards that supernal height which seemed to be the hidden source of its melodious utterance. O oh soul, wandering in the region of sleep and dreams, said the voice, what is all thy searching and labor worth without love? Why art thou lost in a silence without song? I raised my eyes, seeking for the one who thus spoke to me, but could see nothing. In life's great choral symphony, the voice continued, the keynote of the dominant melody is love. Without the keynote there can be no music, there is dumbness where there should be sound, there is discord where there should be harmony. Love, the one vibrant tone to which the whole universe moves in tune. Love, the breath of God the pulsation of his being, the glory of his work, the fulfillment of his eternal joy. Love, and love alone, is the web and texture and garment of happy immortality. O soul that seekest the way to wisdom and to power, what dost thou make of love? I trembled and stood mute. It seemed that I was surrounded by solemn presences whose nearness I could feel but not see and unknowing who it was that spoke to me, I was afraid to answer. Far in the past, thousands of ages ago, went on the voice, the world we call the sorrowful star was a perfect note in a perfect scale. It was in tune with the divine symphony, but with the sweep of centuries it has lagged behind. It has fallen from light into shadow, and rather than rise to light again, it has made of itself a discord opposed to the eternal harmony. It has chosen for its keynote hate, not love. Each nation envies or despises the other. Each man struggles against his fellow man and grudges his neighbor every small advantage. And more than all, each creed curses the other, blasphemously calling upon God to verify and fulfill the curse. Hate, not love. This is the false note struck by the pitiful earth world today, swinging out of all concordance with spherical sweetness, hate that prefers falsehood to truth, malice to kindness, selfishness to generosity. O oh, sorrowful star, doomed so soon to perish, turn, turn, even in thy last moments, back to the divine ascendant before it is too late. I listened, and a sense of hopeless fear possessed me. I tried to speak, and a faint whisper crept from my lips. Why? I murmured to myself, for I did not suppose anyone could or would hear me. Why should we and our world perish? We knew so little at the beginning, and we know so little now. Is it altogether our fault if we have lost our way? A silence followed. A vague, impalpable sense of restraint and captivity seemed closing me in on every side. I was imprisoned, as I thought, within invisible walls. Then, all at once, this density of atmosphere was struck asunder by a dazzling light as of cloven wings. But I could see no actual shape or even suggestion of substance. The glowing rays were all. And the voice spoke again with grave sweetness and something of reproach. Who speaks of losing the way? it asked. When the way is, and has ever been, clear and plain, nature teaches it, law and order support it. Obey, and ye shall live. 
disobey and ye shall die there is no other ruling than this out of chaos who is it that speaks of losing the way when the way is and has been and ever shall be clear and plain i stretched out my hands involuntarily my eyes filled with tears o oh, angel invisible i prayed forgive my weakness and unwisdom how can the world be saved or comforted by a love it never finds again a silence again that dazzling quivering radiance flashing as in an atmosphere of powdered gold what does the world seek most ardently it demanded the love of god or the love of self if it seeks the first all things in heaven and earth shall be added to its desire if the second all shall be taken from it even that which it hath i had as i thought no answer to give but i covered my weeping eyes with both hands and knelt before the unseen speaker as to some great spirit enthroned love is not love that loves itself went on the voice self is the image not the god wouldst thou have eternal life then find the secret in eternal love love which can move worlds and create universes the love of soul for soul angel for angel god for god i raised my head and uncovering my eyes looked up but i could see nothing save that all-penetrating light which imprisoned me as it were in a circle of fire love is that power which clasps the things of eternity and makes them all its own said the voice in stronger tones of deeper music it builds its solar systems its stars its planets with a thought it wakes all beauty all delight with a smile it lives not only now but forever in a heaven of pure joy where every thousand years is but one summer day to love there is no time no space no age no death what it gives it receives again what it longs for comes to it without seeking god withholds nothing from the faithful soul i still knelt wondering if these words were intended only for me or for some other listener for i could not now feel sure that i was without a companion in this strange experience there is only one way of life went on the voice only one way the way of love whosoever loves greatly lives greatly whosoever misprizes love is dead though living give all thy heart and soul to love if thou wouldst be immortal for without love thou mayest seek god through all eternity and never find him i waited there was a brief silence then a sudden wave of music broke upon my ears a breaking foam of rhythmic melody that rose and fell in a measured cadence of solemn sound raising my eyes in fear and awe I saw the lambent light around me begin to separate into countless gradations of delicate color, till presently it resembled a close and brilliant network of rainbow tints intermingled with purest gold. It was as if millions of lines had been drawn with exquisite fineness and precision so as to cause intersection or reciprocal meeting at given points of calculation and these changed into various dazzling forms too brilliant for even my dreaming sight to follow yet i felt myself compelled to study one particular section of these lines which shone before me in a kind of pale brightness and while i looked it varied to more and more complex moods of color and light if one might so express it till by gradual degrees it returned again to the simpler combination thus are the destinies of human lives woven and interwoven said the voice from infinite and endless points of light they grow and part and mingle together till the destined two are one often they are entangled and disturbed by influences not their own but from interference which through weakness or fear they have themselves permitted but the tangle is forever unraveled by time the parted threads are brought together again in the eternal weaving of spirit and matter no power human or divine can entirely separate the lives which god has ordained shall come together 
man's ordainment is not god's ordainment wrong threads in the weaving are broken no matter how no matter when love must be tender yet resolved love must not swerve from its given pledge love must be all or nothing the light network of living golden rays still quivered before my eyes till all at once they seemed to change to a rippling sea of fine flame with waves that gently swayed to and fro tipped with foam crests of prismatic hue like broken rainbows wave after wave swept forward and broke in bright amethystine spray close to me where i knelt and as i watched this moving mass of radiant colour in absorbed fascination one wave brilliant as the flush of a summer's dawn rippled towards me and then gently retiring left a single rose crimson and fragrant close within my reach i stooped and caught it quickly surely it was a real rose from some dewy garden of the earth and no dream one rose from all the roses in heaven said the mystic voice in tones of enthralling sweetness one fadeless and immortal only one but sufficient for all one love from all the million loves of men and women one but enough for eternity how long the rose has awaited its flowering how long the love has awaited its fulfillment only the recording angels know such roses bloom but once in the wilderness of space and time such love comes but once in a universe of worlds i listened trembling i held the rose against my breast between my clasped hands o oh, sorrowful star went on the voice what shall become of thee if thou forsakest the way of love o oh, little sphere of beauty and delight why are thy people so blind oh that their eyes were lifted unto heaven their hearts to joy their souls to love who is it that darkens life with sorrow who is it that creates the delusion of death i found my speech suddenly nay surely i said half whispering we must all die not so and the mystic voice rang out imperatively there is no death for god is alive and from him life only can emanate i held my peace moved by a sudden sweet awe from eternal life no death can come continued the voice from eternal love flows eternal joy change there is change there must be to higher forms and higher planes but life and love remain as they are indestructible the same yesterday today and forever i bent my face over the rose against my breast its perfume was deliciously soft and penetrating and half unconsciously i kissed its velvet petals as i did this a swift and dazzling radiance poured shower-like through the air and again i heard mysterious chords of rhythmic melody rising and falling like distant waves of the sea the grave tender voice spoke once again rise and go hence it said in tones of thrilling gentleness keep the gift god sends thee take that which is thine meet that which hath sought thee sorrowing for many centuries turn not aside again neither by thine own will nor by the will of others lest old errors prevail pass from vision into waking from night to day from seeming death to life from loneliness to love and keep within thy heart the message of a dream the light beating about me like curved wings slowly paled and as slowly vanished yet i felt that i must still kneel and wait this atmosphere of awe and trembling gradually passed away and then rising as i thought and holding the mystic rose with one hand still against my breast i turned to feel my way through the darkness which now encompassed me as i did this my other hand was caught by someone in a warm eager clasp and i was guided along with an infinitely tender yet masterful touch which i had no hesitation in obeying 
Step by step I moved with a strange sense of happy reliance on my unseen companion. Darkness or distance had no terrors for me. And as I went onward with my hand held firmly in that close yet gentle grasp, my thoughts became, as it were, suddenly cleared into a heaven of comprehension. I looked back upon years of work spread out like an arid desert uncheered by any spring of sweet water, and I saw all that my life had lacked, all to which I had unconsciously pressed forward longingly, without any distinct recognition of my own aims, and only trusting to the infinite powers of God and nature to amend my incompleteness by the perfection of the everlasting whole. And now, had the answer come? At any rate, I felt I was no longer alone. Someone, who seemed the natural other half of myself, was beside me in the shadows of sleep. I could have spoken, but would not, for fear of breaking the charm. And so I went on and on, caring little how long the journey might be, and even vaguely wishing it might continue for ever. When presently a faint light began to peer through the gloom, I saw a glimmer of blue and gray, then white, then rose color, and I awoke, to find nothing of a visionary character about me, unless perhaps a shaft of early morning sunshine streaming through the porthole of my cabin could be called a reflex of the mystic glory which had surrounded me in sleep. I then remembered where I was, yet I was so convinced of the reality of what I had seen and heard, that I looked about me everywhere for that lovely crimson rose I had brought away with me from dreamland, for I could actually feel its stem still between my fingers. It was not to be seen, but there was delicate fragrance on the air as if it were blooming near me, a fragrance so fine that nothing could describe its subtly pervading odor. Every word spoken by the voice of my dream was vividly impressed on my brain, and more vivid still was the recollection of the hand that had clasped mine and led me out of sleep to waking. I was conscious of its warmth yet, and I was troubled, even while I was soothed, by the memory of the lingering caress with which it had been at last withdrawn. And I wondered, as I lay for a few moments in my bed inert, and thinking of all that had chanced to me in the night, whether the long earnest patience of my soul, ever turned as it had been for years toward the attainment of a love higher than all earthly attraction, was now about to be recompensed. I knew, and had always known, that whatsoever we strongly will to possess comes to us in due season, and that steadily resolved prayers are always granted. The only drawback to the exertion of this power is the doubt as to whether the thing we desire so ardently will work us good or ill. For there is no question but that what we seek we shall find. I had sought long and unwearyingly for the clue to the secret of life imperishable and love eternal. Was the mystery about to be unveiled? I could not tell, and I dare not humor the mere thought too long. Shaking my mind free from the web of marvel and perplexity in which it had been caught by the visions of the night, I placed myself in a passively receptive attitude, demanding nothing, fearing nothing, hoping nothing, but simply content with actual life feeling life to be the outcome and expression of perfect love. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Bunch of Heather It was a glorious morning, and so warm that I went up on deck without any hat or cloak, glad to have the sunlight playing on my hair and the soft breeze blowing on my face. The scene was perfectly enchanting. The mountains were bathed in a delicate rose-purple glow, reflected from the past pomp of the sun's rising. The water was still as an inland lake, and every mast and spar of the Diana was reflected in it as in a mirror. 
a flock of seagulls floated round our vessel like ferry boats some of them rising every now and then with eager cries to wing their graceful flight high through the calm air and alight again with a flash of silver pinions on the translucent blue while i stood gazing in absorbed delight at the beauty which everywhere surrounded me captain derrick called to me from his little bridge where he stood with folded arms looking down good morning what do you think of the mystery now mystery and then his meaning flashed upon me oh the yacht that anchored near us last night where is she just so and the captain's look expressed volumes where is she oddly enough i had not thought of the stranger vessel till this moment though the music sounding from her deck had been the last thing which had haunted my ears before i had slept and dreamed and now she was gone there was not a sign of her anywhere i looked up at the captain on his bridge and smiled she must have started very early i said the captain's fuzzy brows met portentously ay very early so early that the watch never saw her go he must have missed an hour and she must have gained one it's rather strange isn't it i said may i come on the bridge certainly I ran up the little steps and stood beside him, looking out to the farthest line of sea and sky. "'What do you think about it?' I asked, laughingly. "'Was she a real yacht or a ghost?' The captain did not smile. His brow was furrowed with perplexed consideration. "'She wasn't a ghost,' he said, "'but her ways were ghostly. That is, she made no noise, and she sailed without wind. Mr. Harland may say what he likes.' i stick to that she had no steam but she carried full sail and she came into the sound with all her canvas bellying out as though she were driven by a stormy southwester there's been no wind all night yet she's gone as you see and not a man on board heard the weighing of her anchor when she went and how she went beats me altogether at that moment we caught sight of a small rowing boat coming out to us from the shore pulled by one man who bent to his oars in a slow listless way as though disinclined for the labour boat ahoy shouted the captain the man looked up and signalled in answer a couple of our sailors went to throw him a rope as he brought his craft alongside he had come so he slowly explained in his soft slow almost unintelligible highland dialect with fresh eggs and butter hoping to effect a sale the steward was summoned and bargaining began i listened and looked on amused and interested and i presently suggested to the captain that it might be as well to ask this man if he too had seen the yacht whose movements appeared so baffling and inexplicable the captain at once took the hint say donald he began invitingly did you see the big yacht that came in last night about ten o'clock oh ay was the slow answer but my name's no tunnelled it's just jamie captain derrick laughed jovially beg pardon jamie then did you see the yacht oh ay i've seen her many a day she's a real shentleman i smiled the yacht jamie looked up at me ah my lady you'll be making a fool of jamie with a glance like a sun sparkle on the sea jamie's no fool with the right sort and the yacht is a shentleman and the shentleman's the yacht for it's the shentleman that pays whatever captain derrick became keenly interested the gentleman the owner of the yacht you mean jamie nodded just that and proceeded to count out his store of new laid eggs with great care as he placed them in the steward's basket what's his name ah that's our mickle learnin said jamie with a cunning look i canna say it rightly can you say it wrongly i suggested i wouldna he replied and he lifted his eyes which were dark and piercing to my face i darena is he such a very terrible gentleman then inquired captain derrick jocosely Jamie's countenance was impenetrable. "'Ye'll be seeing her for yourself, whatever,' he said. "'Ye'll no miss her in the waters twixt here and sky. 
he stooped and fumbled in his basket presently bringing out of it a small bunch of pink bell heather the delicate waxen type of blossom which is found only in mossy marshy places the gentleman wanted as much as i could find o this he said and he had it all but this wee biddy will my lady wear it for luck i took it from his hand as a gift i asked smiling i wouldn't a take any money for it he answered with a curious expression of something like fear passing over his brown weather-beaten features tis fairies making i put the little bunch in my dress as i did so he doffed his cap good day to ye i'll be no seeing ye this way again why not how do you know one way in and another way out he said his voice sinking to a sort of meditative croon one road to the west and the other to the east and round about to the meeting place oh ay ye'll make it clear sailing without wind eh interposed captain derrick like your friend the shentleman how does he manage that business jamie looked round with a frightened air like an animal scenting danger then shouldering his empty basket he gave us a hasty nod of farewell and scrambling down the companion ladder without another word was soon in his boat again rowing away steadily and never once looking back a wild chap said the captain many of these fellows get half daft living so much alone in desolate places like mull and seeing nothing all their time but cloud and mountain and sea he seems to know something about that yacht though that yacht is on your brain captain i said merrily i feel quite sorry for you and yet i dare say if we meet her again the mystery will turn out to be very simple it will have to be either very simple or very complex he answered with a laugh i shall need a good deal of teaching to show me how a sailing yacht can make steam speed without wind ah good morning sir and we both turned to greet mr harland who had just come up on deck he looked ill and careworn as though he had slept badly and he showed but faint interest in the tale of the strange yacht's sudden exit it amuses you doesn't it he said addressing me with a little cynical smile wrinkling up his forehead and eyes anything that cannot be at once explained is always interesting and delightful to a woman that is why spiritualistic mediums make money they do clever tricks which cannot be explained hence their success with the credulous quite so i replied but just allow me to say that i am no believer in mediums true i forgot he rubbed his hands wearily over his brows then asked did you sleep well splendidly and i must really thank you for my lovely rooms they are almost too luxurious they are fit for a princess why a princess he queried ironically princesses are not always agreeable personages i know one or two fat ugly and stupid some of them are dirty in their persons and in their habits there are certain princesses in europe who ought to be washed and disinfected before being given any rooms anywhere i laughed oh you are very bitter i said not at all i like accuracy princess to the ingenuous mind suggests a fairy tale i have not an ingenuous mind i know that the princesses of the fairy tales do not exist unless you are one me i exclaimed in amazement i'm very far from that well you are a dreamer he said and resting his arms on the deck rail he looked away from me down into the sunlit sea you do not live here in this world with us you think you do and yet in your own mind you know you do not you dream and your life is that of vision simply i'm not sure i should like to see you wake for as long as you can dream you will believe in the fairy tale the princess of hans andersen and the brothers grimm holds good and that is why you should have pretty things about you music roses and the like trifles to keep up the delicate delusion i was surprised and just a little vexed at his way of talking why even with the underlying flattery of his words should he call me a dreamer i had worked for my own living as practically as himself in the world 
and if not with such financially successful results, only because my aims had never been mere money-spinning. He had attained enormous wealth, I a modest competence. He was old, and I was young. He was ill and miserable. I was well and happy. Which of us was the dreamer? My thoughts were busy with this question, and he saw it. Don't perplex yourself, he said, and don't be offended with me for my frankness. My view of life is not yours, nor are we ever likely to see things from the same standpoint. Yours is the more enviable condition. You are looking well, you feel well, you are well. Health is the best of all things. He paused, and lifting his eyes from the contemplation of the water, regarded me fixedly. That's a lovely bit of bell-heather you're wearing. It glows like fiery topaz. I explained how it had been given to me. Why, then, you've already established a connection with the strange yacht, he said, laughing. The owner, according to your highland fellow, has the same blossoms on board, probably gathered from the same morass. Surely this is quite romantic and exciting. And at breakfast, when Dr. Braille and Mr. Swinton appeared, they all made conversation on the subject of my bunch of heather, till I got rather tired of it, and was half inclined to take it off and throw it away. Yet somehow I could not do this. Glancing at my own reflection in a mirror, I saw what a brilliant yet dainty touch of color it gave to the plain white serge of my yachting dress. It was a pretty contrast, and I left it alone. Miss Catherine did not get up to breakfast, but she sent for me afterwards, and asked if I would mind sitting with her for a while. I did mind, in a way, for the day was fair and fine, the Diana was preparing to pursue her course, and it was far pleasanter to be on deck in the fresh air than in Miss Catherine's stateroom, which, though quite spacious for a yacht's accommodation, looked rather dreary, having no carpet on the floor, no curtains to the bed, and no little graces of adornment anywhere, nothing but a few shelves against the wall on which were ranged some blue and black medicine bottles, relieved by a small array of pill-boxes. But I felt sorry for the poor woman, who had elected to make her life a martyrdom to nerves, and real or imaginary aches and pains. So I went to her, determined to do what I could to cheer and rouse her from her condition of chronic depression. Directly I entered her cabin, she said, Where did you get that bright bit of heather? I told her the whole story, to which she listened with more patience than she usually showed for any talk in which she had not first share. It's really quite interesting, she said, with a reluctant smile. I suppose it was the strange yacht that had the music on board last night. It kept me awake. I thought it was some tiresome person, out in a boat with a gramophone. I laughed. Oh, Miss Harland, I exclaimed. Surely you could not have thought it a gramophone. Such music! It was perfectly exquisite. Was it? And she drew the ugly grey woollen shawl in which she was wrapped closer about her sallow throat as she sat up in her bed and looked at me. Well, it may have been to you. You seem to find delight in everything. I'm sure I don't know why. Of course, it's very nice to have such a happy disposition. But really, that music teased me dreadfully. Such a bore having music when you want to go to sleep. I was silent, and having a piece of embroidery to occupy my hands, I began to work at it. I hope you're quite comfortable on board, she resumed presently. Have you all you want in your rooms? I assured her that everything was perfect. She sighed. I wish I could say the same, she said. I really hate yachting, but father likes it, so I must sacrifice myself. Here she sighed again. I saw she was really convinced that she was immolating herself on the altar of filial obedience. You know he is very ill, she went on, and that he cannot live long. He told me something about it, I answered, and I said then, as I say now, that doctors may be wrong. Oh, no, they cannot be wrong in his case, she declared, shaking her head dismally. They know the symptoms, and they can only avert the end for a time. 
I'm very thankful Dr. Brayle was able to come with us on this trip. I suppose he is paid a good deal for his services, I said. Eight hundred guineas, she answered. But you see, he has to leave his patients in London and find another man to attend to them during his absence. He is so very clever and so much sought after. I don't know what I should do without him, I'm sure. Has he any special treatment for you? I asked. Oh, yes, he gives me electricity. He has a wonderful battery. He has got it fitted up here in the next cabin. And while I hold two handles, he turns it on and it runs all over me. I feel always better for the moment, but the effect soon passes. I looked at her with a smile. I should think so. Dear Miss Harland, do you really believe in that way of administering electricity? Of course I do, she answered. You see, it's all a question of what they call bacteriology nowadays. Medicine is no use unless it can kill the microbes that are eating us up inside and out. And there's scarcely any drug that can do that. Electricity is the only remedy. It gives the little brutes a shock. And the poor lady laughed weakly. And it kills some, but not all. It's a dreadful scheme of creation, don't you think, to make human beings no better than happy hunting grounds for invisible creatures to feed upon? It depends on what view you take of it, I said, laying down my work and trying to fix her attention, a matter which was always difficult. We human beings are composed of good and evil particles. If the good are encouraged, they drive out the evil. If the evil, they drive out the good. It's the same with the body as the soul. If we encourage the health-working microbes, as you call them, they will drive out disease from the human organism altogether. She sank back on her pillow wearily. We can't do it, she said. All the chances are against us. What's the use of our trying to encourage health-working microbes? The disease-working ones have got the upper hand. Just think, our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents are to blame for half our evils. Their diseases become ours in various new forms. It's cruel, horrible. How anyone can believe that a god of love created such a frightful scheme passes my comprehension. The whole thing is a mere business of eating to be eaten. She looked so wan and wild that I pitied her greatly. Surely that is not what you think at the bottom of your heart, I said gently. I should be very sorry for you if I thought you really meant what you say. Well, you may be as sorry for me as you like. And the poor lady blinked away tears from her eyes. I need someone to be sorry for me. I tell you, my life is a perfect torture. Every day I wonder how long I can bear it. I have such dreadful thoughts. I picture the horrible things that are happening to different people all over the world, nobody helping them or caring for them. And I almost feel as if I must scream for mercy. It wouldn't be any use screaming, but the scream is in my soul all the same. People in prisons, people in shipwrecks, people dying by inches in hospitals, no good in their lives and no hope, and not a sign of comfort from the God whom the churches praise. It's awful. I don't see how anybody can do anything or be ambitious for anything. It's all mere waste of energy. One of the reasons that made me so anxious to have you come on this trip with us is that you always seem contented and happy, and I want to know why. It's a question of temperament, I suppose, but do tell me, why? She stretched out her hand and touched mine appealingly. I took her worn and wasted fingers in my own and pressed them sympathetically. My dear Miss Harland, I began. Oh, call me Catherine, she interrupted. I'm so tired of being Miss Harland. Well, Catherine, then, I said, smiling a little. Surely you know why I am contented and happy. No, I do not, she said, with quick, almost querulous eagerness. I don't understand it at all. You have none of the things that please women. You don't seem to care about dress, though you are always well-gowned. You don't go to balls or theaters or race meetings. 
you are a general favorite yet you avoid society you've never troubled yourself to take your chances of marriage and so far as i know or have heard tell about you you haven't even a lover my cheeks grew suddenly warm a curious resentment awoke in me at her words had i indeed no lover surely i had one that i knew well and had known for a long time one for whom i had guarded my life sacredly as belonging to another as well as to myself a lover who loved me beyond all power of human expression here the rush of strange and inexplicable emotion in me was hurled back on my mind with a shock of mingled terror and surprise from a dead wall of stony fact it was true of course and catherine harland was right i had no lover no man had ever loved me well enough to be called by such a name the flush cooled off my face the hurry of my thoughts slackened i took up my embroidery and began to work at it again that is so isn't it persisted miss harland though you blush and grow pale as if there was someone in the background i met her inquisitive glance and smiled there is no one i said there never has been any one i paused I could almost feel the warmth of the strong hand that had held mine in my dream of the past night. It was mere fancy, and I went on. I should not care for what modern men and women call love. It seems very unsatisfactory. She sighed. It is frequently very selfish, she said. I want to tell you my love story. May I? Why, of course, I answered a little wonderingly for I had not thought she had a love story to tell. It's very brief, she said, and her lip quivered. There was a man who used to visit our house very often when I first came out. He made me believe he was very fond of me. I was more than fond of him. I almost worshipped him. He was all the world to me, and though father did not like him very much, he wished me to be happy, so we were engaged. That was the time of my life, the only time I ever knew what happiness was. One evening, just about three months before we were to be married, we were together at a party in the house of one of our mutual friends, and I heard him talking rather loudly in a room where he and two or three other men had gone to smoke. He said something that made me stand still and wonder whether I was mad or dreaming. Pity me when I'm married to Catherine Harland pity him i listened i knew it was wrong to listen but i could not help myself well you'll get enough cash with her to set you all right in the world anyhow said another man you can put up with a plain wife for the sake of a pretty fortune then he my love spoke again oh i shall make the best of it he said i must have money somehow and this is the easiest way there's one good thing about modern life Husbands and wives don't hunt in couples as they used to do, so when once the knot is tied, I shall shift my matrimonial burden off my shoulders as much as I can. She'll amuse herself with her clothes and the household, and she's fond of me, so I shall always have my own way. But it's an awful martyrdom to have to marry one woman on account of empty pockets when you're in love with another. I heard, and then I don't know what happened. Her eyes stared at me so pitifully that I was full of sorrow for her. Oh, you poor Catherine, I said, and taking her hand, I kissed it gently. The tears in her eyes brimmed over. They found me lying on the floor insensible, she went on tremulously, and I was very ill for a long time afterwards. People could not understand it when I broke off my engagement. I told nobody why, except him. He seemed sorry and a little ashamed but I think he was more vexed at losing my fortune than anything else. I said to him that I had never thought about being plain, that the idea of his loving me had made me feel beautiful. That was true. My dear, I almost believe I should have grown into beauty if I had been sure of his love. I understood that. She was perfectly right in what, to the entirely commonplace person, would seem a fanciful theory. Love makes all things fair 
and any one who is conscious of being tenderly loved grows lovely as a rose that is conscious of the sun grows into form and colour well it was all over then she ended with a sigh i never was quite myself again i think my nerves got a sort of shock such as the great novelist charles dickens had when he was in the railway accident do you remember the tale in forster's life how the carriage hung over the edge of an embankment but did not actually fall and dickens was clinging on to it all the time he never got over it and it was the remote cause of his death five years later now i have felt just like that my life has hung over a sort of chasm ever since i lost my love and i only cling on but surely i ventured to say surely there are other things to live for than just the memory of one man's love which was not love at all you seem to think there was some cruelty or unhappiness in the chance that separated you from him but really it was a special mercy and favor of god only you have taken it in the wrong way i have taken it in the only possible way she said with resignation oh do you call it resignation i exclaimed to make a misery of what should have been a gladness think of the years and years of wretchedness you might have passed with a man who was a merely selfish fortune hunter you would have had to see him grow colder and more callous every day your heart would have been torn your spirit broken and god spared you all this by giving you your chance of freedom such a chance you might have made much of it if you had only chosen she looked at me but did not speak love comes to us in a million beautiful ways i went on heedless of how she might take my words the ordinary love or i would say the ordinary mating and marriage is only one way you cannot live in the world without being loved if you love she moved on her pillows restlessly i can't see what you mean she said how can i love i have nothing to love but do you not see that you are shutting yourself out from love i said you will not have it you bar its approach you encourage your sad and morbid fancies and think of illness when you might just as well think of health oh i know you will say i am up in the air as your father expresses it but it's true all the same that if you love everything in nature yes everything sunshine air cloud rain trees birds blossoms they will love you in return and give you some of their life and strength and beauty she smiled a very bitter little smile you talk like a poet she said and of all things in the world i hate poetry there don't think me cross go along and be happy in your own strange fanciful way i cannot be other than i am dr braille will tell you i'm not strong enough to share in other people's lives and aims and pleasures i must always consider myself dr braille tells you that i queried to consider yourself of course he does if i had not considered myself every hour and every day i should have been dead long ago i have to consider everything i eat and drink lest it should make me ill I rose from my seat beside her. I wish I could cure you, I murmured. My dear girl, if you could, you would, I am sure, she answered. You are very kind-hearted. It has done me good to talk to you and tell you all my sad little history. I shall get up presently and have my electricity and feel quite bright for a time. But as for a cure, you might as well try to cure my father none are cured of any ailment unless they resolve to help along the cure themselves i said she gave a weary little laugh ah that's one of your pet theories but it's no use to me i'm past all helping of myself so you may give me up as a bad job but you asked me i went on did you not to tell you why it is that i am contented and happy do you really want to know a vague distrust crept into her faded eyes not if it's a theory she said i should not have the brain or the patience to think it out i laughed 
it's not a theory it's a truth i answered but truth is sometimes more difficult than theory she looked at me half in wonder half in appeal well what is it just this and i knelt beside her for a moment holding her hand i know that there are no external surroundings which we do not make for ourselves and that our troubles are born of our own wrong thinking and are not sent from god i train my soul to be calm and my body obeys my soul that's all her fingers closed on mine nervously but what's the use of telling me this she half whispered i don't believe in god or the soul i rose from my kneeling attitude poor catherine i said then indeed it is no use telling you anything. You are in darkness instead of daylight, and no one can make you see. Oh, what can I do to help you? Nothing, she answered. My faith, it was never very much, was taken from me altogether when I was quite young. Father made it seem absurd. He's a clever man, you know, and in a few words he makes out religion to be utter nonsense. I understand and indeed I did entirely understand. Her father was one of a rapidly increasing class of men who are a danger to the community, a cold, cynical shatterer of every noble ideal, a sneerer at patriotism and honor, a deliberate iconoclast of the most callous and remorseless type. That he had good points in his character was not to be denied. A murderer may have these but to be in his company for very long was to feel that there is no good in anything that life is a mistake of nature and death a fortunate ending of the blunder that god is a delusion and the soul a mere expression signifying certain intelligent movements of the brain only i stood silently thinking these things while she watched me rather wistfully presently she said are you going on deck now yes i'll join you at luncheon don't lose that bit of heather in your dress it's really quite brilliant like a jewel i hesitated a moment you're not vexed with me for speaking as i have done i asked her vexed no indeed i love to hear you and see you defending your own fairy ground for it is like a fairy tale you know all that you believe it has practical results anyway i answered you must admit that yes i know and it's just what i can't understand we'll have another talk about it some day would you tell dr braille that i shall be ready for him in ten minutes i assented and left her i made for the deck directly the air meeting me with a rush of salty softness as i ran up the saloon stairway what a glorious day it was sky sea and mountains were bathed in brilliant sunshine the diana was cutting her path swiftly through waters which marked her course on either side by a streak of white foam i mentally contrasted the loveliness of the scene around me with the stuffy cabin i had just left and seeing dr braille smoking comfortably in a long reclining chair and reading a paper i went up to him and touched him on the shoulder your patient wants you in ten minutes i said he rose to his feet at once courteously offering me a chair, which I declined, and drew his cigar from his mouth. "'I have two patients on board,' he answered, smiling. "'Which one?' "'The one who is your patient from choice, not necessity,' I replied coolly. "'My dear lady,' his eyes blinked at me with a furtive astonishment. "'If you were not so charming, I should say you were... "'Well, shall I say it? a trifle opinionated i laughed granted i said if it is opinionated to be honest i plead guilty miss harland is as well as you or i she's only morbid true but morbidness is a form of illness a malady of the nerves i laughed again much to his visible annoyance curable by outward applications of electricity i queried when the mischief is in the mind but there, I mustn't interfere, I suppose. Nevertheless, you keep Miss Harland ill when she might be quite well. 
A disagreeable line furrowed the corners of his mouth. You think so? Among your many accomplishments do you count the art of medicine? I met his shifty brown eyes, and he dropped them quickly. I know nothing about it, I answered, except this, that the cure of any mind trouble must come from within, not from without, and I'm not a Christian scientist either. He smiled cynically. Really not? I should have thought you were. You would make a grave error if you thought so, I responded curtly. A keen and watchful interest flashed over his dark face. I should very much like to know what your theories are, he said suddenly. You interest me greatly. I am sure I do, I answered, smiling. He looked me up and down for a moment in perplexity, then shrugged his shoulders. You are a strange creature, he said. I cannot make you out. If I were asked to give a professional opinion of you, I should say you were very neurotic and highly strung and given over to self-delusions. Thanks, and I made him a demure little curtsy. I look it, don't I? No, you don't look it, but looks are deceptive. There I agree with you, I said, but one has to go by them sometimes. If I am neurotic, my looks do not pity me, and my condition of health leaves nothing to desire. His brows met in a slight frown. He glanced at his watch. I must go, he said. Miss Harland will be waiting. And the electricity will get cold, I added gaily. See if you can feel my neurotic pulse. He took the hand I extended and remained quite still, conscious of the secret force I had within myself. I resolved to try if I could use it upon him in such a way as to keep him a prisoner till I chose to let him go. I watched him till his eyes began to look vague and a kind of fixity settled on his features. He was perfectly unconscious that I held him at my pleasure, and presently, satisfied with my experiment, I relaxed the spell and withdrew my hand. "'Quite regular, isn't it?' I said carelessly. He started as if roused from a sleep, but replied quickly, "'Yes, oh yes, perfectly. I had almost forgotten what I was doing. I was thinking of something else. Miss Harland.' "'Yes, Miss Harland is ready for you by this time,' and I smiled. "'You must tell her I detained you.' He nodded in a more or less embarrassed manner and turning away from me, went rather slowly down the saloon stairs. I gave a sigh of relief when he was gone. I had from the first moment of our meeting recognized in him a mental organization, which in its godless materialism and indifference to consequences was opposed to every healthful influence that might be brought to bear on his patients for their well-being, whatever his pretensions to medical skill might be. It was to his advantage to show them the worst side of a disease in order to accentuate his own cleverness in dealing with it. It served his purpose to pamper their darkest imaginings, play with their whims and humor their caprices. I saw all this and understood it, and I was glad that, so far as I might be concerned, I had the power to master him. End of chapter 4